I want to welcome you here this afternoon and um, give you just a little bit of an idea of our <coughs> loosely intended format for the afternoon. Um, at, what we'll do is we'll, we'll start with our, our speaker who is graciously here today and um, then we will have a time of question and answer. We're going to kind of moderate that, so I'll come up and and instead of people just shouting stuff out, if you'd let me, if you have a question, raise your hand up and and um, and give me a call out if I don't notice you. But I'll I'll call on folks and uh, we'll do that for you know, 15 or 20 minutes or so maybe. And um, and then we have some some announcements about upcoming events, and then we'll invite you to some refreshment and some you know conversation amongst yourselves and an opportunity to less formally um, meet with our speaker with Marianne. Sound okay to folks? Excellent. We are grateful to have with us today Reverend Dr. Marianne Deer Zimmerman, who was with us in worship and shared the message of the day. What a blessing that was. Thank you. And who is here to speak with us this afternoon. Um, I'm a firm believer in, in short introductions. So Marianne is an ordained minister and a licensed clinical professional counselor. She has um, attended Elmhurst College for her bachelor's in psychology, uh, went to Northern Baptist Theological Seminary for her master's of divinity, and to Eden Theological Seminary for her do doctorate of ministry and pastoral counseling, and then has a whole slew of letters after her <laughs> name, um, which you would all recognize if I spewed them out. Um, she is an amazing speaker and, um, and counsels from her heart and uh, we are just blessed and excited that she's here with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to invite you, Marianne, to come up and speak with us. That's good. Thank you. And you can hear me now? You yes. can? Okay. It's a, a fairly big crowd. I'm going to pass around some books, <clears throat> some books, and then when we're done, whoever's the last one, just put them here. Um, if they look interesting, write them down. Um, I'm using them to prepare, so I, I'm not loaning them out, but there you go. <laughs> but I, I think they would be helpful uh, for you to, to peruse and look at. I think maybe to add to qualifications, uh, I am married 42 years now to Linda, uh, who's a nurse. She's not here today at the, the meeting. And I have four, we have four children. Uh, the oldest is 32, no, 33. <laughs> the time gets away. And then the, the next one is 29 and 28. Those are three boys. And then Rachel, who some of you have met, is from China, and she's 14 and knows more than all of us put together. <laughs> <laughs> but she's very, very smart and, and just a delight. And, uh, and I'm happy, happy to be here. I think I want to start with a story that may, may have little. And you know what? If I get to talking too low, and you can't hear. At my church that I used to preach at, I'm used to people doing this. So if you need to, do, just do that. When you said Elmhurst College, it reminded me of a little story that might pertain today. I was a psychology major back, and now we're talking 1971. I was a freshman way back then. I am proud to say I'm 63 years old. This lady doesn't mind bragging about age. I hope I get to add to it. So in 1972, I did a psychology internship during the month of January at Elgin State Mental Hospital. Has anybody ever seen Mount Elgin State? <laughs> okay, anybody ever worked there? Oh, and maybe they don't want to admit it, I, I don't know. 
So if you've seen the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, yeah. that's Elgin State back in the 70s. I don't know if it's changed any since then because I haven't been back. So there were these, these big um, dorm areas with beds and big day area, and I was just this, at that time, a, a male student, rookie student, a sophomore, and we were just turned loose to do whatever we thought was meaningful in, on the unit, okay? So after like two days there, and these were the combination of the worst of the worst in my book. I mean, there were just destitute, psychotic, everything. Uh, I decided I was gonna change my major. I'm like, if this is what psychology is, no more. I'm not doing this. And then it got worse. I had this terrible prayer. I talked about my prayer life this morning. I came home and I said, God, I'm not doing this. I'm changing my major. We need to look for something else. I, I'm ashamed to admit this. These people are subhuman. There's no point to being here. And it didn't take long for me to get an answer from the Lord. Again, it wasn't an audible voice. But a feeling of guilt came over me when I kind of heard the words back. So what makes you better than them? And if that wasn't enough to take you to your knees, uh, the instructions came with that. Why don't you try just treating them the same way you would if they were what you considered normal? So I did that. I went into the day room and sat down with people that were obviously psychotic <laughs> and some in between and just sat there and talked with them and listened to their stories and listened to their craziness and treated them respectfully, treated them with kindness. Sometimes I prayed with them. And about a week and a half, two weeks later, the staff, one of the staff people came up to me and he said, you know, you're doing something different around here that's making a difference. And we haven't quite figured out what you're doing, but it's really phenomenal. So we want you to come to the treatment planning meeting and tell us what you're doing. Well, okay. <clears throat> and they were waiting for this college student to come up with some really great answer on why the attitude and the behavior was changing in the unit. I wasn't sure why. So I sat down and they said, well, tell us what you're doing. And I looked at him and I said, well, I'm just treating them with the same kind of respect I would as if they're what you and I would call normal. I'm treating them like valuable human beings. And the staff looked at me with this blank look, which I will never forget. They were waiting for more. And I had no more to give them. And after that was clear that I had no more to give them, they said, okay, thank you. And I was dismissed to continue on what I was doing. I always had the feeling they were disappointed with the answer. But when I left, I felt that at least they were not disappointed with the effect of the actions. So today I hope I don't leave you with the same feeling I left them, as if, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I hope that in my life my actions speak louder than my words. And time, only time will tell. I want to talk today, I'm going to recap a little of this morning, but I want to talk with you about why does somebody come out at age 60? I've only been out two and a half years. I feel like I was born on August the 8th, 2014. 
that's when my formal name change happened in the Joliet Courthouse. There's a lot of practice that went in before then, but I was finally able to be me. Why would somebody do this? Because I get that question from lots of people. Why did you wait so long? Um, I get that from family, and some of the family that's disowned me on my wife's side. Uh, well, you should have spoke up sooner, and you caused a whole heck of a lot of trouble for everyone. So this is sort of the story that cracked the opening as to why I decided to come out. Okay, I'll start with this, a story about my dad, and I'll try to run through it quick enough. It does, it does relate. <laughs> so my mother passed away when she was 86. That would have been 2006, I think. Somebody do the math, spare me. And my dad mourned for her for about a year, you know. He was in this assisted living program uh, unit. And so by age 87, he turned into a teenager again. He was running around trying to date the women in the assisted living unit <laughs> and trying to get them to marry him. And I said, Dad, why do you want to get married? Why, remember how much trouble it is to get married and all the adjustments. Why do you need to do that now? Well, he wouldn't quit. So he started calling old friends uh, that didn't live in Kentucky. He lived in Louisville, Kentucky. And he called this woman, I'm going to call her Naomi because we're recorded and, and uh, there might be a connection. And I, uh, you know, she's, I don't, she's so old and, and she's got dementia now herself, but it, just to protect her. So Naomi, he calls Naomi, whom he had known since he was 20 years old. They grew up together uh, out west. They were part of the same church denomination. They worked together in ministry. My dad was a minister. And during the time when he was the executive secretary of the church group that we grew up in, she worked for him for about 15 years. And she was single her whole life. And so he decided, Naomi's it. So he called her and proposed to her, and she turned him down. <laughs> right? And it bruised his ego. So he kept calling her, and she kept turning him down. And then he calls me, and he says, I know the reason. It's a little bit like Pops on Grumpy Old Men, you know. I know the reason. She's a lesbian. But Dad, how do you know that? Well, I know that she would be attracted to me. Why wouldn't she be? See, 87-year-old teenager. He keeps on with this, and she keeps turning him down. I said, Dad, she's single. It'd be as big a change for her to get married as it would be for you to, well, for you to be single. So finally, I just decided I'd had enough. And I, you know, I had to hit him between the eyes, right up here with somewhere else to look dead. Truth is, she's not attracted to you. Just stay friends, leave her alone, and I don't think it's fair for you to call her a lesbian because you don't know that for sure. Silence on the other end, end of that phone call. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from dad. <clears throat> Well, 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 he says. <laughs> Which you know what that means. It means that I'm on the hop seat now. She is a lesbian. <laughs> Dad, come on. How do you know that? Tell me how you know that. She told me. <laughs> and she said to me, Gideon, I don't want you to tell a single soul because I've held this secret my whole life and I was afraid that if I would tell people in the church I would never have been able to be a missionary I would have never been able to work in the church I would have never been accepted so I kept it my secret between me and just a very very few people and I was afraid if I told you that I would get fired. 
from my job. I trust you a lot, but I wasn't sure I could. But I wanted you to know that because I love you, and because I respect you, I didn't want you to think that I would refuse you for any other reason than I'm lesbian and it, it just doesn't work that way. And then he said, she said, will this change our friendship? And my dad said, I told her, yes. It's gonna, it's gonna make it better because now we don't have this secret between us, and we can really be friends. Well, I heard that story and I thought, well, Dad, that's a good line. I will believe that I didn't tell him this. I'll believe it when I see the actions. Well, he and Naomi talked to each other much more than I ever remember. They were great friends until the day he died. And that changed me. Because I got to thinking, by, by then I knew I was transgender. I was 56 years old. I'd been hiding my whole life. I did exactly what Naomi. I knew that if I'd tell my secret, I'd have never been a minister. I'd have lost my marriage. I'd have never been a parent. I'd have never been able to do any of the things I did. I knew her story. And I just couldn't help but think, you know, growing up where she did, passing up all the opportunities for dating, for everything, carrying this secret, I couldn't help but wonder, why wait an entire lifetime before you tell the truth? How sad. And I always knew Naomi. I knew her only for a few years, and then I moved away. I always knew there was some kind of wall about her. She was friendly, she was kind, but there was something about her you could only get so far, and then she would kind of dodge you. And that explained it to me. And I decided that whereas I really respected her as a church leader, she went way up in my book. for setting herself aside. And yet, she taught me the tragedy, not only of, of her, but of me and so many people carrying secrets because they're afraid of the church. Afraid of the church. How tragic. Well, my dad sort of was pretty smug like the cat that swallowed the canary that day. He thought he really pulled it over on the counselor's son who should have figured this all out. And so he's pretty proud of himself. But I had a secret that he never knew. I never told him or my mother that I was transgender. My parents died before I told them. They never knew me. I always kept them at a distance um, because I couldn't risk. And I'll, I'll go to my grave with them. And I think there's a lot of parents that don't know their kids. Even when their kids come out to them, parents don't know their kids. I counsel more transgender and gay and lesbian students now that I'm out. 
And some do. Some parents are extremely supportive. But, you know, in this information age, I said it this morning, it's the information age, it's not the age of truth, and it's not the age of insight. We're very well-informed people that are very blind. So what my dad never knew, and I'm going to recap quick because some, some of the folks heard this this morning. I'll, I'll, he, he never knew that at age three, my mother never knew. If they did, they never confronted me. That I was playing dress up already at age three with her clothes in the basement. And as soon as they would come down, I'd run and hide. They never knew that I really wanted to be a girl. They gave me dolls when I was three and four years old, and it was pretty clear that they backed away from me when I played with them. Uh, so they never gave me more than one. <laughs> they never knew that they almost, they never knew why I was anorexic as a teenager. I shared this this morning. Like a lot of transgender, people, uh, when you hit adolescence, that's the big test. Your body goes the direction you don't want it to go. Girls have their period, they develop, and they, they loathe their body. I have transgender clients who can't take showers without panic attacks, who hate themselves when they go to take a shower. I was not quite that bad. Maybe I was worse. I did not want muscles. I didn't want to be uh, a jock. So the only thing.